the other day, I was shown a collection of pieces written about Holy Week by some children in Primary 2, describing the events. And uh, there was one from a boy, which was very good, very accurate. Uh, he'd really understood the sequence of events, all the story of Jesus coming into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the Last Supper, and being arrested and crucified, and so on. And then he got to Easter Sunday, and he said, two ladies, he a very polite little boy, two ladies went to the tomb early in the morning, they found the stone rolled away, and they went into the tomb. There was no body there, and all there was was a t-shirt, a pair of trousers, and a pair of socks. Jesus had risen. Well, it's good to laugh on Easter Sunday. Uh, there's an old custom, uh, German custom, I think that uh, the priest had to tell a joke during the sermon to make sure that everybody laughed because with the resurrection of Christ we really do have something to smile, to laugh, to be joyful about the greatest thing imaginable. But these stories of the empty tomb, discovering the empty tomb, they do carry conviction. Uh, even Graham Greene, the novelist who had a rather on and off attitude to faith, said that, said that specifically of what we heard this morning. Now there's much more than those stories to give a foundation to our faith in the resurrection, but they are part of it. Just think of today's gospel, the way it describes how the women get there first. They go first. We somehow really expect that. Then the running of the two disciples, uh, just like boys, really excited boys, and one running faster than the other. And poor Peter coming up panting after the other one, the beloved disciple whom we usually call John. And then the cloths, the cloths. There's that larger set of them lying on the ground, the body shrouds. But the, there's another one, a smaller cloth. It would have been about the size of a large napkin, and it would have covered the head and the face of a buried person, in this case, Jesus. And that one, our translation says, was rolled up in a place by itself. Actually, it was neatly folded, neatly folded. Now Jesus must have done that himself with his own hands, taking it off his face, not just letting it fall to the ground like the others, but folding it. Isn't that a very human touch? It's such a human thing to do every day. We fold things. How often as a boy, Jesus must have seen his mother doing it. She would have had to teach him to do it. And meanwhile, the beloved disciple, John, who's got to the tomb first, he doesn't go in. He waits for Peter, Peter the leader. So Peter goes in and he sees these things. And being Peter, he just sort of scratches his head and doesn't know what to make of it. But John, the beloved disciple, he goes in, he goes in second, but he gets the point first. He saw and he believed, said the Gospel. He saw and he believed. Yes, I think that little detail, for me anyway, it carries a great deal of conviction. It could, of course, all be fiction, but the stakes are too high. Uh, there's a story of the, um, the football manager who was asked 
so football is a matter of life or death for you. And he said, oh no, it's much more important than that. And it was so it was with the resurrection. It really was an important matter. It didn't bring the disciples an easy life. It took them way out of their comfort zone, as we say these days. It threw, threw them out into a pagan world because they felt they must tell people this. And most of them came to an unfortunate end. Most of them were done away with. And when they wrote down the memories of how it all began, it wasn't like writing a short story in a magazine. It was just a little touch that tripped John into faith, a folded cloth. Perhaps he had seen Jesus folding cloths before, and he recognized the style. It's little things like that which make us believe one another, or like one another, or dislike one another. And it was like that, and is like that, with believing in Christ, in recognizing him. Little things leading to a great conclusion. All the great conclusions coming home, as a poet put it, but coming home through little details. The folded cloth is not a proof, it was a sign though. Now last night here, uh, five people were baptized and three more who already been baptized in other Christian communities became Catholics. And if you'd asked them why, they would probably, so far as they could say why at all, they'd probably mention small things in themselves. But a lot of small things coming together, converging, setting off connections in their minds, and leading them to convictions. Signs, not proofs, but adding up to a definite conclusion. The empty tomb, the folded cloth, they were first signs that something new, something mysterious had happened, and that Jesus was no longer imprisoned in the world of the dead. Well, I don't want to list Signs, but just to leave you with that question. What is it that gives you the conviction that Jesus has risen from the dead, that he is really present among us, present with his Father, present to us, that death no longer holds him? Another little thing that touches me, anyway, in the first reading, we, we heard Peter, again, the first Peter, who took time to come to belief in Jesus' resurrection. Peter, now quite convinced, speaking to a pagan Roman soldier and his household, Cornelius. This is 10, 15 years after these events. And telling Cornelius, yes, this man we knew, this man we lived with, he rose from the dead. The tomb was empty, he showed himself to us. We know that he is alive, alive in God. A great change in Peter. Now, probably uh, as in this, at this very moment, as we're here, Pope Francis, who is the 266th successor of Peter is on the balcony there giving his message Urbi et Orbi, as they say, to the city and the world. It's an extraordinary thought. There is Peter 2,000 years ago speaking to a pagan soldier and now Still today, there's a successor of Peter saying the same simple thing to the whole world. Christ is risen. Well, just two things to, to finish with. Yes, it's small things, but the resurrection is not a small thing. It is a big conclusion. It's a wonderful one. The resurrection 
changes everything. It gives our life, it gives the life of the whole human race, it gives, in fact, the life of the whole universe a quite new horizon. It opens up the perspective of a life which is stronger than death, of a fullness of life we can hardly imagine. It's the hidden beginning, what happened that first Easter Sunday, hidden beginning, hidden in the sacraments, hidden in our faith of a whole new world where everything is put right and where, so to speak, we'll have nothing to eat and drink except joy. Joy in ourselves, joy in one another, joy in God, joy in a new heaven and earth. If Jesus has risen, then the great battle between good and evil has already been won. Good has had the last word. And all the outbursts of evil we experience are really just the death rattle of a dying world. Or as one ancient Christian writer vividly put it, they're like the wrigglings of a snake after the head has been cut off. The head of evil has been cut off. The body still wriggles, we know that. But that Jesus was risen changed his disciples. And the sign of that again was in the first reading. Peter talking to Cornelius and his household. Now Peter was a Jew, Cornelius was a pagan. It would have been unthinkable for a devout Jew to even enter the house of a pagan, least of all of a Roman soldier, one of the hated occupying power. And so what was it that took Peter out of the world he had grown up in, out of his Jewish world, into this great terrifying pagan world all around? Because he knew that the resurrection was for everyone. The God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob is not just the God of Israel, but the God of the whole universe, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of each one of us. And it's small things that lead to this big conclusion. Well, uh, we are small things. And we can point others to the big conclusion. If you like, we could almost say, we're the clothes, we're the t-shirt, we're the trousers, we're the socks that the living Christ now wears in this life. And our faith, hope, love, can be assigned to others, to the world. If we live simply, if we try to take the Beatitudes as our rule of life, we can be small signs pointing to this great conclusion of the resurrection of Christ. If we don't make gods of sex or money or power and position, if we live chastely, moderately, humbly, we can be signs. If we live lives without the old leaven of malice and anger and greed, we can be signs. If we care about others, if we're generous, if we're kind, if we prefer to serve rather than dominate and forgive rather than hold grudges, we can be signs. If we pray and believe, we can be signs. If we are joyful, we can be signs. If we're faithful in little things, we can be signs. And then Jesus will have risen not just in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, but in us and in the world we live in.